Hi dear friends, today we are going to deal with a very important topic in constitutional law that is nothing else but Article 14 of the Indian Constitution. Article 14 of the Indian Constitution, as you are aware, it, deal, it's dealt in artic, uh, it deals with equality rights. Now, uh, along with Article 19 and 21, Article 14 uh, forms the uh, bedrock of the Indian Constitution. It's the foundation of the Indian Constitution. It's so important. Now, uh, coming to equality, Article 14 is not the only article dealing with equality under our Constitution. Equality is dealt in Article 40, 15, 16, 17 and 18 of the Constitution. But 14 is the primary article in the Fundamental Rights Chapter, that is the Part 3 of the Indian Constitution. This is the first fundamental right, Article 14 of the Indian Constitution. Now today, let's have a very brief uh, overview of Article 14 of the Constitution because it's a very, very, very big topic and I cannot uh, compress the whole concept in one or two or even three or four hours. So let's start with our study of Article 14 of the Constitution. Now, Article 14 reads, State shall not deny, the state shall not deny to any person equality before law and equal protection of laws within the territory of India. Now, there are two parts to this article. The state shall not deny equality before law and equal protection of law within the territory of India. Now, what is the uh, relevance of these two parts? Now, there are certain basic aspects. Now, usually, many of the basic fundamental rights, the freedoms uh, embodied in Article 19, it is limited to uh, citizens. But this article, it has been clarified, is available to citizens as well as non-citizens. So equality can be claimed not only by citizens of India, it can also be claimed by non-citizens. This has to be kept in mind, one aspect of Article 14 to show how broad it is. Now, uh, there was a case, uh, National Legal Service Authority versus uh, Union of India, a 2014 case where uh, the ambit was explained by the Apex Court. The court held that equality is applicable or this concept is uh, having effect of uh, men, women, transgender, that is every category of persons. And it is also applicable or uh, it has its effect on citizens and non-citizens. So the provision equality before law and equal protection of law has an, oh, it encompasses everyone within the territory of India. So that aspect is clear. Now the question is, what is the relevance of these two concepts? That is equality before law and equal protection of law within the territory of India. Now, in the early period, the Apex Court was of the opinion that the two concepts of equality in the first part of Article 14, equality before law, and the second part, equal protection of law, signifies the very same thing. And there is no difference. Both are equality. For example, in the case called uh, State of West Bengal versus Anwar Ali, um, that case, the case between West Bengal and Anwar Ali, the court had observed that there is no much difference between the first part equality and the second part equality. 
However, in the later cases, the court had categorically stated that there is a difference between the first part of Article 14 and the second part. Whereas the first part is in one sense a negative right. Negative right implies that it prevents the state from denying equality before law to anyone. The state is under a restriction to see that uh, no one is denied of equality. Whereas in the second part, equal protection of law, it has a positive content. It is a positive right or it has a positive content. Uh, that is, it implies that state is under a bounded duty to see that uh, equal protection is being given to the citizens and uh, non-citizens who are it is. So, uh, what is the difference? In a difference uh, a thing, uh, we can find an analogy in the American uh, concept of equal protection of law. That is, uh, another difference is that uh, the court have observed in cases like uh, 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 certain cases, uh, for example, uh, uh, later cases that the concept of equality uses the term equality in a generic sense. That is the general concept of equality. Whereas the second part, equal protection of law, uses the term uh, law equality with the reference to equal protection of law. It uses the term that is the first law refer, uh, refers to generic law. In the second part, it refers to what you call. Uh, the statutes and the law applicable in India, specifically the statute. First law in the general sense or a generic sense. Second, specific laws. Now the difference has to be, it's a little bit confusing. The difference has to be understood with the reference that the second part, equal protection of laws within the territory of India, has to be understood with reference to the inequities and inequalities existing in India, which existed in India, with regard to deprived certain uh, categories of persons, including the Dalits, uh, the uh, women, the persons of the minorities. And this particular section or article gives prominence to the concept that they should be uh, uh, free from any forms of discrimination. That was the later approach by the court. Uh, in Srinivas uh, versus uh, a case, uh, Srinivas versus state of Tamil Nadu, that was approach uh, was taken later. Now, with regard to the origin of this two concept, how these two concepts evolved in Article 14, that is the term equality before law and the term equal protection of law, there are two different sources. The term equality before law is de derived from the concept of rule of law. The rule of law concept was uh, uh, existed earlier. Uh, it goes back to very ancient times. Uh, but uh, in the later period, it was popularized by the jurist Dicey, A.V. Dicey of England, who laid out three concepts of uh, rule of law. And the concept of rule of law, <coughs> uh, the, the, the two concepts of rule of law uh, contains a provision uh, that there shall be equality before law and equal subjugation of all classes of people before the ordinary courts, ordinary law administered by the ordinary courts. That is one concept of rule of law as propounded by Dicey. And he goes on further to say that equality, that the rule of law means that there should not be arbitrary power conferred on an authority. And there should not even be wide discretionary power. That is the concept of Dicey. So, a Dicean concept of rule of law contains a provision which says that there should be 
equality before law and equal subjugation of all the classes of people before the ordinary courts. That is, right from the yeoman to the king should be subject to ordinary courts and laws administered by the ordinary courts. And the first provision of the Article 14, equality before law, it is well said it is uh, originated from the concept of rule of law. So when you want to interpret, the courts want to interpret the concept of rule of law, the first part, then of course, obviously, it has something, <clears throat> it has something to do with uh, the rule of law. With regard to the second part, the second part is derived from the American Constitution, to be very precise, the 14th Amendment of the American Constitution. So it has some analogy, similarity with the American Constitution dealing with the equal protection of laws. So these are the sources of these two articles. And the content also, I have pointed out, there is some difference in the content, which is for the courts to more uh, broadly elaborate, analyze, so we have to keep in mind that constitution is not a, a static document. It is an organic document. It can be uh, interpreted progressively by the courts at different stages. And different concepts can be evolved at the later stage by the court. So you leave it to the court. So what is well settled? I have just pointed it to you. So this is with regard to the uh, construction of the article that is State shall not deny to any person equality before law and equal protection of law within the territory of India. Now we come to the concept of equality or uh, what do you call the content of this right? The content of the concept of equality. Now you are aware that equality is such an important provision that if you take cases in the High Court or the Supreme Court, a large number of cases, repetition, service matters are all dependent on this Article 14 of the Indian Constitution. Now, what is the content of equality? We are now going into the content of this right. Now, equality is a very broad concept. Now, what exactly is an equality? You cannot have total, absolute equality in this world. Men come in different sizes, colors. They talk different languages. So we can't say that everyone should be equal. Say everyone should be 5 feet 6 inches tall. They should all talk English in such a baritone or such a, another tone. <laughs> they should have only one party. So men come in different sizes. So you can't accept Absolute equality. Now, what is this article aiming at? What is this article aiming to prevent? Now, there cannot be absolute equality, as I told you earlier. Now, equality, philosophically, Immanuel Kant has come with the statement that what equality implies is uh, citizens or persons should, should be treated with equal worth. That is, there is a worth of man. Everyone is worthy. Everyone has some worth. And this worth has to be accepted by the community, the state. So this is the concept of Immanuel Kant. And on the other hand, the jurists and legal philosophers of the uh, century like Dawkins says that equality means there should be equal care and concern. Equal care and concern. <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> and there should be equal value for every person. That is what is implied by the concept of equality to the philosophical aspect of this concept. Now, as I told you earlier, equality does not mean that there can be absolute equality because there are differences between persons. Now, the concept of equality doesn't mean that the uh, 
what you call the elephant dancing with the chicken and saying that one for all and each for one. It cannot be. Now, then what is equality or what is the content of this section? Article 14 states that persons similarly situated should be treated alike. Article 14 says that there shall not be discrimination. So you keep that in mind. There shall not be discrimination. So discrimination is the antithetic or the opposite of equality. There shall not be discrimination. So Article 14 is a protection against any form of discrimination. Now the question is, what is discrimination? Now the concept of discrimination is that if equals are treated equally, unequally, if equals are treated unequally, there is discrimination. Similarly, if you treat unequals equally, there also there is discrimination. <clears throat> now, if you ask a five-year-old child to run with a fully grown-up uh, 18-year-old man and say that the 18-year-old man had won the race, there is no equality. If you have a woman to fight in a boxing ring with a very hefty male and say that the male has won, there also there is no equality. So equality means similarly situated equals are to be treated equal. If equals are treated unequally, then there is discrimination. Similarly, if unequals, I mean unequals are treated equally also, there is discrimination. So this has to be kept in mind. Now, Article 14, when we go to the content, you have laws and laws, rules, orders, bylaws, statutes. If a rule or an order or a bylaw violate Article 14, then it is invalid. Then when it becomes invalid, when it becomes violation of Article 14, when it is discriminatory. Either the executive action or the statute, it discriminates, it's arbitrary, then it is violative of Article 40. <coughs> now here, I'm having a small problem with the throat. Sorry. Now, <coughs> here, Uh, regarding Article 14, the Apex Court, through a number of cases, had laid down that what Article 14 tries to prevent is class legislation and not reasonable classification. So I'll explain. See, what Article 14 says or prevents is discrimination. You can see that in India there are laws which discriminate person in one sense. For example, you can see laws providing reservation to the uh, uh, deprived classes, uh, uh, law providing discrimination, uh, positive discrimination or reservation to the Dalits, to SEST, to the SCBC. So, can you claim that it is violative of Article 40? It's not. Why not? So, if a law has a reasonable classification, it's okay. It's not discriminatory. Whereas, if a law is, is having an unreasonable classification, then it is bad. 
Now that is the core of Article 14. That Article 14 provides that there shall not be discrimination. One point. Second is what is discrimination? Under Article 14, there can be reasonable classification but not class legislation. If it is a class legislation, it is a discrimination. <clears throat> if it is a reasonable classification, it is not discriminatory. That is the content. Now, what is reasonable legislation? I mean, reasonable classification and class legislation. Now, in cases like uh, F.N. Balsara, then other case of uh, Justice uh, Tendulkar and Ramakrishna Dalmia, the court have come with the principle. The principle is that when you take a parent group, a universal group, and you separate some from the parent group, and you provide special treatment for them, as in the case of providing reservation to the SCBC. That is, you take a parent group, you remove some from it, and you give special treatment. Superficially, that is violation of equality. But the uh, test says that when you give special provision, this can either be a class legislation or it can be a reasonable classification. Okay, that is it. When a, from a big group you remove a second uh, small group and give them separate provision, it can either be a class legislation or a reasonable classification. If it is a class legislation, it is discriminatory and violative of Article 40. If it is a reasonable classification, then it is valid. Now the question is, what is a reasonable classification and what is a class legislation, as I told you earlier. In these cases, the court have held that if in a classification there is one intelligible differentia and two rational nexus then the classification is perfectly okay and it is a reasonable classification so in a classification if it fulfills two concepts that is re, uh, what do you call intelligible differentia and two rational nexus then it is a valid classification, reasonable classification, and it is valid. Whereas, if there is no intelligible differentia or rational nexus, then it becomes what? Then it becomes a case of discrimination and constitutionally invalid on the ground of violation of Article 40. Now, what is the test of intelligible differentia and rational nexus? Now, intelligible differentia says that from a universal group or a big group, you classify some person. First of all, there is an intelligible differentia between the classified group and the parent group. That when you classify some person from the parent group, there should be a differentiation, intelligible difference between the classified group and the parent group. That is the first part of it. Secondly, why we are classifying this group? That particular matter should have some relevance to the object for which you are classifying. That is the, when you classify a certain group, that group should have some rational nexus with the object of the classification. I will illustrate with an example, only then it will be clear. See, in the Contract Act, there is a rule that minor cannot enter into a contract. A minor cannot enter into a contract. So, if you are under the age of minority as fixed by the Indian contract, say 15 or 16, then you cannot enter into a contract 
if you are studying for a school or college, if you are under a minor, you cannot enter into a contract. So, a group minors are excluded from a right to enter into a contract. Now, the question is whether it is violative of equality. Because equality is saying that there shall be equality before law. Now, here, let's consider the group minor. There is a difference between the minor and the majors, major, majority of the people, that is the major. There is a difference because they are young people under one particular age, 18 for one law, 16 for, it depends, 21 for another law. So under the contract, if it is a minor, he cannot enter into a contract. So there is a intelligible difference here between the minors and the majors. That is there. Now what is the rational nexus? Why we are providing this law? We are providing this law because if the minors are allowed to enter into a contract, there is all possibility that they can be subject to coercion or defraud or uh, uh, they could be mistook, mistook into the contract. So it is to protect the minor we are making the provision. So obviously the law which says that the minors cannot enter into a contract is a law which has an intelligible differentia and rational nexus. I hope that it is somewhat clear. You can make your references and make it more clear. Whereas, you consider a law which says that only uh, black-haired persons can enter into a contract or only white-skinned persons can enter into a contract. Here also there can be intelligible difference here, white skin, black skin, black hair, brown hair, but there is no rational nexus with regard to making a contract. So this is the concept of intelligible difference here and rational nexus which was adopted by the court for so many years. Now after some year in a case uh, in 1970s, E.P. Royapa was the state of Tamil Nadu. The Supreme Court came with a new doctrine, the doctrine of arbitrariness. It, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, broadened the concept of uh, uh, the concept of discrimination and violation of equality. Here, the court held that whenever an action, whenever a law is arbitrary on the face of it, it is arbitrary then it is violated of Article 14 of the Constitution. You don't have to fulfill the test. Even if some, some, something fulfills the test of intelligible differentiation and rational nexus, if an action or a law has an element of arbitrariness, then it is violative of Article 14 of the Constitution. So that is called the new doctrine of arbitrariness evolved at the later stage in the 70s. A jurist like Shirvai is of opinion that this new doctrine has to be discarded because uh, everything propounded by the new doctrine could have been served by the earlier law, <clears throat> the Tendulkar and Belsara case law of intelligible differentiation, rational nexus. So let the criticism be there. But nowadays the court is adopting more the principle of arbitrariness. So this is uh, the evolution of the concept of equality as per the court law, the apex court decision broadening the concept of equality. For In E.P. Royapa, the court had made with the contention that <clears throat> um, arbitrariness is the sworn enemy of antithetic to the concept of equality. They said that um, talking about the uh, earlier uh, test of intelligible differentia, the court observed that the concept of equality cannot be cribbed, cabined and confined within doctrinal limits. It cannot be confined. Here also you have to keep in mind as I told you earlier in the rule of the concept of dicey there is the concept of what you call there shall not be white discretionary power or arbitrary power. That element is taken here. 
that a quality is the sworn enemy of arbitrariness. So there are two tests. The court have followed all these two tests in the case. Now we don't have the uh, time to go deep into it, but let's uh, analyze some cases. We can have hundreds and hundreds of cases, but we just analyze one or two cases or three or four, whatever it is, whatever we have to finish it off in some time. The first case which we can analyze is the case of. Uh, uh, say, <clears throat> um, K. A. Abbas versus Union of India. K. A. Abbas versus Union of India. No, K. A. Abbas was a filmmaker and a, uh, what do you call journalist, uh, a very reputed person. He had uh, uh, directed, uh, scripted, and all a movie by the name, The Tale of Five Cities. And um, when it came to the question of censorship, uh, the censors, uh, censor board, they gave an A certificate to this particular film. Now, K. Abbas challenged this before the Apex Court. His contention was this concept of, you know, uh, films are classified into adults only and the universe. Adults only can be uh, viewed only by the adult. That is the law. So his contention is that uh, uh, this particular law of censorship and uh, A and U film, its violating of his freedom of speech and expression and also his equality. We, in this case, we are more concerned about equality about equality is violative equality because it treats discriminate films from another art form other art forms further a classification of movies as A and U is also discriminated so two pronged attack was made now he said that you take any other form of art painting there is no adult painting young painting if you have an exhibition only for adults, nothing like that. Even for dra drama, stage shows, there is, I think there is no adult and young. Only for this particular art form, films, you have this classification of A and U. So here, this art form is being discriminated. Further, A and U also has some element of discrimination. The court went deep into it, court studied all the thing, and the court held that it does not discriminate, right? Because, uh, see, uh, film has a different, film is the only medium which has a very wide acceptance and wide influence on the uh, uh, huge sections of the population and especially in the younger people. There is a chance that the younger people may believe what is happening in the make-believe world of films. They may think that is the reality. So, films are on a different plane and there is nothing wrong in discriminating them. And further, there is also a rational nexus in uh, uh, providing AU classification. And it was uh, upheld by the court. So the contention of equality, uh, I mean uh, the intelligible differential, rational nexus concept and the classification was uh, uh, believed to have been fulfilled in this particular case and therefore classification was held valid because it fulfills both the test of intelligible differential and the rational nexus. That is classification of viewers into young men and adult intelligible differential. Object not to contaminate the mind of the young people, the rational nexus. Now we come to another case, the second case which we discussed, an earlier case, Mitho versus State of Punjab. In Mitho versus State of Punjab, the question before the court uh, was related to Section 303 of the Indian Penal Code. Section 302, you may be knowing Section 302, it deals with punishment for 
uh, murder, that is, if a person commits murder, he can either be given uh, the pena, I mean, the punishment of death penalty or life imprisonment. The two choices are there. If a person commits murder, the court is free to give him either life imprisonment or death penalty. That is one rule. 303 dealt with a murder committed by a person who is undergoing life imprisonment. It says that if a person who is on life imprisonment for having committed uh, an offence for which life imprisonment can be granted during the course of the imprisonment or on a parole commits another murder then there is only one punishment that is death penalty. No choice. So a person undergoing life imprisonment commits another murder comes before the court, murder proved, court has no discretion, grant him death penalty. There ends it. So, some aggrieved persons claim that there is an unreasonable categorization between persons who commit murder uh, on a life imprisonment and the persons who commit murder for the first time or uh, or some that is if a, there is a classification between a, a accused uh, of murder a person accused of murder provided he is a, a undergoing life imprisonment he will be treated differently uh, if a person uh, is not under life imprisonment he will be treated in a different manner so this there is no intelligible differentia between uh, these two categories. That was the claim by the aggrieved person. That is unreasonable. Arbitrary. You see, they had come with the contention that under this particular rule, if a person who is undergoing life imprisonment on some count is released and then he commits murder, he will not be punished. It is applicable to only to a person who is undergoing imprisonment, commits murder. So all these things were noticed by the court, as you call the, to, uh, the to, to, uh, we cannot call it to, to judicial notice, but the court took notice of it. And the court held that this classification of persons murdering as persons committing it uh, for the first time and later undergoing an imprisonment is discriminatory and violative of Article 14 of the Indian Constitution. The court held that this is arbitrary, unreasonable. So you have an idea of how the court is uh, distinguishing cases like this. So we have umpteen number of cases, for example, in a case called now the question is uh, this classification, with regard to classification we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, e e classification need not be of a huge group. Uh, in a case called Chiranjit Lal Chaudhary versus Union of India, the court held that even a single person can be, a single individual can be considered as a class and a separate provision can be made for it. In that particular case what happened was uh, the government to cover, uh, uh, I think, uh, a spinning mill, Sholapur spinning mill or something, I'm a little confused. Uh, Sholapur spinning mill solely, one particular spinning mill was taken over by the government on the ground that there is a maladministration by a statute, by an act created only for that particular uh, factory. And so some shareholders challenged it. There was two questions. Another question involved was whether a company can claim fundamental right, whether the court held that company can also claim fundamental right of Article 14 equality. Equality can be claimed even by a, a legal, uh, uh, what you call, uh, a legal person like a company, but it's limited. And the court further held that a law can have, uh, a special law can be made for a single individual. Even a single individual can be considered as a class. Did you get it? I think you, I hope you get it. That is, you can classify as per the reason there can be a classification. So even for one single individual, there can be a classification. For example, you can see that special provisions are there for president. President cannot be 
uh, what do you call uh, there are special provisions and privileges for the president and nobody can say that he has such privilege why can't I now uh, some cases like uh, for example there are so many cases so I just uh, deal with some interesting cases uh, for example in a case called Sunil Jatri versus state of Haryana 25% seats were reserved for persons in, in engineering colleges, 25% uh, I mean uh, in medical colleges, I, I am uh, with the letters, uh, it's medical colleges suppose in medical colleges 25% seats were reserved for uh, uh, persons coming from a rural background or who have studied in rural schools. So persons who have studied from rural schools will be getting 25% seats reservation. This was challenged. The court said that this is arbitrary because, see, in the rural school and uh, urban school, in rural schools there can be rich persons, poor persons. So why should you give preference to them? Whereas in an urban school there can be poor persons, rich persons. So you classifying persons on the ground that they are coming from rural schools. That is arbitrary because there can be very rich persons who are studying in rural schools. And further, there is no rational for providing such sort of reservation. <laughs> then again, you have cases like um, Ajay Hasiya versus Khalid Muchi, where the court held that when you are giving a huge percentage of mark for interviews, obviously that is violative Article 14 because there is a chance for the interview board to act, uh, it's not that uh, they act arbitrary, but when huge marks are given for the interview board to act upon, there is a possibility of wide discretion and uh, that can uh, leave rise to arbitrary. So, uh, awarding or uh, uh, giving a huge mark for interview that is obviously violative of Article 14. There was a, another case called. Uh, and going very fast because you have hundreds of cases in it. I just mentioned some cases. You cannot refer it because the principle is all the same. Deepak Sibal versus uh, uh, Punjab University was still another case. Here the question was in an LLP evening. That time you had the evening colleges. Now it's very rare. Uh, in the LLP evening college, seats were reserved only for I mean, not reserved. Seats were allotted only for persons who were working in government uh, sector and it was not given for private sector. So the question was whether this classification between the government sector and private sector with regard to persons studying in a law college, it is having any rational nexus or it is arbitrary. The vote and that it is invalid. In John Vallamattam, Vallamattam, it's a Kerala case. Uh, another issue was came uh, that is under section 118 of the uh, 118 of the uh, Indian uh, Succession Act. Um, there was a, a matter under under section 118 of Indian Succession Act. A Christian with regard to what you call creation of will by a Christian, or uh, when a Christian want to uh, donate or uh, uh, transfer his property by will uh, to any charitable institution that will has to be made within uh, one year of his death. So this rule was not made applicable to any other community. So there also the court have held, these are all court held that that is violative because the uh, discriminating uh, 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 Christians alone with regard to creation of wills uh, that is violative of Article 14. So, so these are certain examples where you can see the approach of the courts. You can refer to hundreds and hundreds of cases. So I couldn't finish it within a small period, uh, but it was uh, uh, I just gave you an overview of the concept of equality. It's such a broad concept. Uh, you can refer to the cases in detail and come to a uh, conclusion. So, so much. Thank you so much for the patient uh, listening. Keep on uh, uh, watching my videos. Thank you all.